Three, two, one. When it's time for launch, the cameras are often trained on the astronauts, the space vehicles, and the mission at hand. But behind every launch is a team of hundreds, sometimes thousands of people who make it possible. At Space Center Houston, we met with one of those hidden figures, spacesuit technician Sharon McDougall. From her Air Force days suiting up crew on the SR-71 Blackbird to Mae Jemison, the first black woman to go to space, we'll get an up-close look at NASA spacesuits, life on the ISS, and insights from a woman who is forever a part of history. This one is going to be cool. It's time to go Behind the Wings. Yeah, to start off, could you just introduce yourself and your former role at NASA? My name is Sharon McDougall and I am a former space shuttle crew escape equipment suit technician. What exactly is a space suit technician? You have the, e the EMU suit, which is the white suit, then you have the launch entry suit, the advanced crew escape suit, the ACES, which is the orange suit, the best suit, the pretty suit. That's my department. So the team dynamic for the space suit technician crew is you'll usually have uh, four to five people assigned to a mission. If it's five astronauts, you're, you'll have four people. If it's seven astronauts, you'll probably get five technicians. We are hidden in plain sight. We're invisible, even though we're right there in all the pictures with the crew members. We're behind the scenes lifting up the astronauts. What was kind of your journey to becoming a spacesuit technician? Well, my journey to becoming a spacesuit technician was an unconventional one. In high school, I had no idea what I was gonna do. I didn't have money to go to college. So my knight in shining armor, I always call them, the Air Force recruiter visited our school. So I raised my hand that day in the auditorium. I wanted to sign up right then. <laughs> he said, you can't sign up right now. So, but on my birthday, I went down and enlisted into the Air Force on my 18th birthday. And the next job that came up was aerospace physiology specialist. The real job was working with the altitude chamber and the dive chamber. So the hypobaric and the hyperbaric chambers. But by being stationed at Beale Air Force Base, the pressure suits went an extra duty because the oh. SR-71 and U-2s were stationed at Bill. You get ready to get suited up. Everything will be lying on the floor. We'd help them put the suit on. We'd pressurize them to you know, check for leaks. Drive them out to the aircraft. This really tall ladder going up to the cockpit. Somebody would hold my feet as I lie down on the, on the ladder platform. They had spurs on the boots to hook up to the aircraft. So if they had to bail out, it would automatically track their legs back. And then the SR would fly about two and a half, three hours and come back and we would recover them. And the U-2 would fly like eight, nine hours. So they'd be gone all day. And working with the SR-71 program is where I got all my training to prepare for my opportunity when it came along to work with NASA. It's called a suit. It sounds like one thing, but how many pieces are, are there? And I'm glad you said that. It's a lot of pieces that I just mentioned about the different parts. What kind of suit do we have going on here? This is a pressure suit. The parts and pieces I was mentioning to you earlier, that silver circular part, that's the dual suit controller. That's the heart of the suit. That's what pressurizes the suit. That's what senses the change in cabin pressure if they lost cabin pressure, and it would automatically pressurize to keep the crew member safe inside. How heavy is this suit and how easy it is to move around? So all together it'd be about 90, about 95, 98 pounds. They're lying on the pad for about three hours yeah. before they launch. Okay. It takes them about eight minutes to get into space. Once they get into space, they're floating. They, they, they take all this off and put it away until it's time to come home. So they got on t-shirts, shorts. This is just for launch and re-entry yeah, yeah. only. Now, of course, the people that do spacewalks will get on the EMU suit, but Very inside cool. the shuttle, they take all this off and put it up. Yeah, this old school right here. Old school. To get a better sense of what it's like for astronauts to live and work in space, we took a closer look at the inside of the International Space Station. So, I mean, where are we right now? We're on the space station, in the kitchenette area, and we're ready to eat. Astronauts actually come in, you know, a month or so ahead of time and choose their menu. All the drinks come in bags like this, like a big Capri Sun, as I tell the kid. And depending on what it is, you put, you would uh, hook it up to the kitchen area where you get hot or cold water. You would insert, hook this to the little gadget that's on the kitchenette, put your cold water in there, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it. And then you have a little straw and you just suck it right out of there. And they can use a tray if they don't want to just play with it and have hold it in their hand. As you notice, it has Velcro, Velcro on the back so they can attach it to their tray. So if they want to have several items, they would just do like just that. And then they'll eat it very carefully unless they want to play with it. As you see on different videos, they like to play with their food. Also, when they pick their food, they actually have a color code. Like the commander's color is red. So all of this food would have a red dot on it. The pilot is yellow, so on and so forth. Same with their suit and orange, because all that orange equipment look alike, right? So they have their name, of course, on their suit. 
and then they have color codes on their boots, their uh, harness. Everybody knows where everybody, whose stuff is whose yeah. by their color code. But that's how they do their food. Yep, it's, it's no, it's not rocket science. Uh, <laughs> so that's where astronauts eat. Oh. That's where they eat and sleep. Yeah. And you notice this bag down here. I think that might be a sleeping bag. Let me see. Well, we should we, should we go take a look at some of the suits? Yes, let's do that. All right, let's do that. Hidden in the back crevices of Space Center Houston. <laughs> so what, what, what do we have here? So the launch entry suit was worn by all space shuttle astronauts that flew aboard space shuttle. No matter what country they came from, what size they were, they had to wear this suit. Like that other suit, they only wore it for spacewalks. Everybody didn't wear it. All astronauts wore in this suit. The reasons that we even had our department why they wear pressure suits is because if they had a loss of cabin pressure or had to bail out for an emergency, the suit would be that to help protect them. Just another layer of safety for the crew members. When you guys see them walking out, waving to the cameras and getting into the big silver Astro van to ride out to the pad, they just left the room with us. So we're some of the last people to see them. And of course, my team strapped them in as well. But this is life-sustaining equipment. It's just not, a, it's not just a pretty suit. They really rely on this in case of an emergency. And that people tend to forget that it's not just a costume. It's actually there to help them in, case of, in the case of an emergency. At NASA, you worked with dozens of astronauts, and one of them was Mae Jemison, the first black woman to go to space. What was that like? I was super excited to find out Dr. Mae Jemison, the first black woman, was getting ready to go to space. And so I'm thinking the whole time, I'm, a, I'm, I'm being on a flight, I'm suiting her up. So, and so I started walking her through it, I introduced myself, said I would be your suit technician, I would be with you throughout the whole process, up until landing, I'm here to take care of you, whatever you need, and just, you know, giving her the whole spiel. We got her fitted and everything, and everything went good. All of her training, she did great. But I wanted to make sure that I was assigned to her because I just felt like I was the best one for the job. And I was good at what I did. I had already done it for almost eight years in the Air Force, and I was one of the best technicians when I was there. And so she might as well have the best, right? I think so. <laughs> and finally, what is your hope, dream, or vision for the future of space exploration? My hope? For, future, for the future of space exploration is that it continues. That we don't let budgetary issues get in the way. That's, that's why I'm kind of glad a lot of the private privatization did happen. They have the money, they're funding their own program, and it's opening it up to more people to be able to participate as well. Well, Sharon, thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. We couldn't cover everything, so leave your comments and questions under the video and we'll get to as many as we can. Now, we've made it to the end of the video, so if you subscribe, thank you so much. And if you don't, just subscribe already. All right, I've gotta get out of here.